start to introduce uh, Professor Hull. So she is currently the general director of the EMBL, gathering more than uh, 80 research groups in molecular biology uh, all over Europe. Edith Hurt completed her PhD in life sciences at the Imperial Cancer Research Fund in London. Then she spent most of her brilliant scientific career in France, first at the Institut Pasteur for nine years, and then at the Institut Curie, where she became the director of the whole genetics and developmental biology unit. Uh, her research focuses on uh, epigenetic processes and the discoveries she and her laboratory made in this field have been recognized by many, many international prizes. I can't cite them all for sure. Uh, Edith Heard was also named a fellow of the Royal Society and appointed as a professor of the prestigious Collège de France, where she has held the chair of epigenetics and cellular memory since 2012. At that time, she was the youngest and one of the first women to hold such a position. She is now the first woman at the EMBL general director's position. So no doubt that she has a lot to tell us about science of women. And it's a great pleasure to listen to her now for the next 35. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for the introduction. Can everyone hear me? Yes, okay, perfect. So um, it's really a pleasure to, to be joining you um, at, this, uh, at this wonderful meeting, despite the Zoom format. Um, I'm going to try and share my screen now and I hope uh, this, will, this will work okay. Um, okay, can you see my full screen format or do I need to swap displays? You will need to swap, I think, yeah. Okay. Does that look good? Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, um, so yes. Yeah, so it's it's really a pleasure to to give this uh, this talk on the science of women. And I have to admit, when I was invited, um, I mean, obviously, it's a great honor. Uh, at the, but then I had to scratch my head to think about which aspect of women and which aspect of science. So what I've decided to do is to give you um, a little bit of everything and also to talk about how EMBL is trying to make sure that the science of women is not only um, nurtured, but amplified uh, looking to the future. So uh, Barbara, thank you very much for the introduction. And he here, I just wanted to give you indeed um, a, a quick overview of, of where I come from. Uh, I don't give it right to the beginning. In fact, I was realizing this morning that maybe I should have actually given a little bit more background so you can realize um, indeed why I ended up where I, I've ended up. And so I spent a large part of my career in France, as you said, I, I was at the Pasteur Institute as a postdoc and then the Curie Institute and, and uh, I spent almost 16 years actually at the Curie Institute. Uh, but I was trained in the UK and maybe for those of you who are listening to this talk thinking about women in science and how they become scientific, uh, I think one of the keys to my own particular career was the fact that I went to an all girls school. I went to a school in, in London, which was just for girls. And that was a privilege. It was a private school. My parents decided to invest in their daughter's future. Um, but it was actually very interesting because it meant that it never occurred to me not to do science. It was one of the choices I made because there was never any um, pressure <clears throat> to do otherwise. And if you were talented, you were encouraged to do science. And that's something I think that is actually everyone has their own personal story. But for me, I really do think that that set me up to never really question why I was doing science as a woman and therefore not be distracted by the occasional encounter, which made me think, well, why am I being maybe treated differently as a woman? In any case, I was very lucky because I landed in France and I do think that France is actually quite a special country in terms of helping um, female scientific careers but no country is perfect. And indeed, there's a lot still to do in the world. As it was mentioned, I became a professor at the Collège de France. Collège de France was set up in 1530. I think I was the on, only the eighth woman, woman ever. Um, and I was probably the youngest woman at the time when I was elected. It's really got a lot better in the last few years um, where we have more and more female professors. 
And the College of France, for those of you who don't know it, is actually a wonderful um, institution that provides science and learning for all. And this is indeed where I actually uh, picked up, I would say, a lot of the knowledge um, that, has, that has been so useful for me in my current role, which is the Director General of the EMBL. And I joined EMBL in 2019. Um, it was, I had a year of grace, so to speak, because um, one year after I started the pandemic hit. And the last year, as I'm sure for all of you, has been incredibly challenging. But I should say that um, running an organization that is dedicated to the life sciences has been an extraordinary privilege as well. And I learned to become a director general in a crisis. And that actually does have opportunities, but it also does have threats. And I'll come to that actually towards the end of my presentation, because particularly for women, I think this pandemic does have big consequences. So um, here I am today um, as Director General. I also run a group and I will tell you um, uh, in a second what my group uh, indeed is, is focused on. I just wanted to give you one snapshot of um, what EMBL's future looks like. We just had our, our new program, which will start in 2022, endorsed by our 27 men member states. And it's called Molecules to Ecosystems. And it's about understanding life in context at the molecular level, which is what the EMBL is all about. Um, and it was a particularly timely program to be thinking about because um, the pandemic that's just hit us is very much about life in context and how when a virus hits a new host or a new set of hosts, um, the, uh, the drama that that can lead to. So um, because the talk is about the science of women, it turns out that my science is the science of women. I actually work on a process that is um, that only happens in women, in females. Um, and it is the process that leads to the balancing between women and men of the um, expression of the genes on their X chromosomes. I think you all know that we have sex chromosomes, women have two X chromosomes, men have one X and one Y chromosome. The Y is very small. It doesn't really have much on it except some useful genes for, for males, but most of the genes are actually on the X. And having two copies in females and only one copy in males is actually a serious problem. And if you don't deal with this imbalance, em the embryo will die very early on. So my whole career for the last 25, almost 30 years now, has been dedicated to try to understand how this happens. And it's a fascinating process because, in fact, one of the two X chromosomes is actually shut down in females during their development. And this is actually randomly chosen. It's either the, the X of your mother or the X of your father in different cells. So all women are actually mosaics of cells expressing either their father's X chromosome or their mother's X chromosome. And although the X is globally similar, there are over a thousand genes, of course, there are a lot of what we call polymorphisms. And so it means that every cell in the human body could be slightly uh, expressing slightly different genes from the X chromosome. And this mosaicism, because it's random, it varies actually between, even between twins, identical female twins are different because of this random X inactivation. So, um, so this is the process I work on, and it's turned out to be very relevant recently because, in fact, many genes on the X are actually involved in the immune system. And I'm sure you've all heard that COVID-19, there might be differences, um, sex-specific differences in the severity of the disease and maybe even in, in infection. And we think that some of the genes involved in the innate immune system that lie on the X and that are differentially expressed on the X chromosome could be involved. So that's it for my science, but I thought I would uh, take this opportunity to say that because I work on a very, very female process, it does actually make me think about women um, a lot more perhaps than other biologists. And one of the things that my science has um, helped me realize is that much of the understanding that we have when it comes to human disease and to the drugs that are used to treat humans has been done on men. So most of medical science up until quite recently, very much focused on men using male animals, um, doing experiments, and then it, men in clinical trials, perhaps for obvious reasons, obviously because women are the ones who obviously become pregnant and it's, and it's very dangerous to do tr uh, clinical trials or to test drugs on women who might be um, in, in that phase of their life. However, it means that most drugs have been developed 
in a male targeted way. And this is something that I think is being revisited very act actively. And I'm a, fa a fierce right, proponent of making sure that this is Oh something. Yes, I woke up uh, on the bike. Ah, ah, I think someone has to mute. I'm not sure who, but it's I can okay. hear someone speaking. <laughs> and now, Thomas, I'm with something and it's Thomas, your mic. <laughs> okay. Thomas Buslap, your mic. So, um, so now I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, EMBL. So um, the EMBL is Europe's unique intergovernmental lo laboratory for life science research. Uh, we have five missions that are shown here to perform excellent research, to do service, to provide service for um, the scientific community of Europe. We have 27 member states that support us and we have to serve them. Um, we also provide advanced training um, from um, the, the earlier stages of careers. Uh, we have courses and conferences, and we train PhDs, postdocs, and staff at all levels. We develop technologies, and actually our site in Grenoble, which is located right next to the ESRF and on the same campus as many of the other institutes there, is actually one of our best technology developing sites as well, that gives access also to uh, the wonderful uh, illumination that we have at the SRF. So I will say a few more words about Embel Grenoble in a minute. And finally, we have a role in trying to integrate European life science research. And this is something I just want to mention. Embel is part of the IRA Forum. And so many of our IRA Forum partners are here and Francesco Sette, uh, the director of the ESRF is, is one of them. And through the IRA Forum and each of us has this role. We try to make sure that um, European science is truly integrated and um, can actually move forward despite many of the challenges that the unity of Europe can sometimes bring, but also the pandemic that we're living through, for example, can bring. So this is the NBL and there are a few numbers here below. We're a very young and dynamic organization. We have 44% turnover of our group leaders every five years. So we're constantly evolving, which makes it quite easy for us also to pick up into new areas such as um, the area I mentioned to you, ecosystems research, which we think is uh, for the future. But we very much are involved in providing service and delivering for our member states. And the pandemic has really shown how EMBL um, has been able to rise up to um, SARS-CoV-2 and all of the impact it's had. So much of our research was very rapidly turned towards this. Our scientific services, including at Amble Grenoble, um, have become you know, very, very much dedicated to this. Even during the lockdown, we were still able to run basic uh, service to the scientific community. Um, we provide advanced training. Um, even during the pandemic, we've had online courses and conferences. Our PhD program has kept running. Um, so we've discovered all of the power of virtual um, training, which um, actually can be quite, uh, quite, uh, uh, I would say, widespread and, and far reaching, maybe more so than, than physical training, although, of course, we would love to get back to being physical soon. We also do a lot of innovation and translation, and innovation is also something that Emil Grenoble is very well known for. And I, as I said, integrating life sciences is part of what we do. And Amble was actually responsible for setting up the COVID-19 data portals that have been used to share the virus and patient data across Europe. This was actually the basis of what um, the European Commission used to set up their platform. So Amble has been very busy during this pandemic across its five missions. And this is, in case you don't know, Embel is actually not just in Embel Grenoble, but actually um, we have six sites. Our headquarters is in Heidelberg, which is where I'm located. And we have several other sites, each of them dedicated to research, but also to some service. And Grenoble and Hamburg are the two sites where structural biology happens at Embel. And here I'm just showing you a little bit about the kind of structural biology that Embel does. Um, even in Heidelberg, we do a lot of structural biology using mainly cryo-EM uh, and advanced uh, cryo uh, approaches such as cryo -clem. In fact, cryo-EM was invented um, by uh, Jacques Dubochet, or the, the, the techniques to, to allow this was actually invented at Embel, Heidelberg, and Jacques Dubochet, um, who got his Nobel Prize, was actually um, at the Embel Heidelberg site. Um, we also provide a lot of sample preparation and characterization, and some of the um, 
the technologies that people all around the world are using were in fact developed at Amble Grenoble. Um, and these are used also on our Hamburg site, the Hamburg site, which is actually located on the DAISY campus. Um, and we also provide data. We are an open science organization that facilitates the storage, use, and exploitation of data. And this is something that is very much hosted at our, our large site in the UK, EMBL EBI, the European Bioinformatics Institute, um, which despite Brexit, because we are EMBL independent of the European Union, uh, EBI remains very much part of EMBL and therefore part of Europe, a little island of Europe in the UK, which makes me as a British uh, citizen, although I've just become French as well, uh, but very happy. So um, I just wanted to say a few words about structural biology at EMBL without going into detail because I'm going to come to the, the topic at hand about women in a, in a minute. Um, but just to highlight the fact that structural biology is very much at the heart of EMBL. When EMBL was set up in 1974, it was actually a structural biologist who did this, John, Sir John Kendrew. So structural biology is really at the heart of what we do. And it's at the heart of understanding how molecules work, which is what EMBL's business is. How do molecules work to make life happen? And I just want to highlight um, recent work at Embel Grenoble, where, for example, the structure of one of the very important complexes that integrates um, uh, the way the genome is expressed was, was actually cracked. And the work of Stephen Kuzak, um, who is uh, one of the most eminent uh, uh, structural biologists working on viruses and RNA viruses uh, in particular, he is the head of Embel Grenoble, and he has had a long and very uh, prestigious history working very closely with the SRF, the ILL, the IBS. So Embel Grenoble is uh, very much one of our, uh, the jewels of our crown um, and the work that is done there continues to be of the very highest level. And we have great hopes for the future with the SRF and, and its new very powerful um, source. So this is uh, structural biology at Embel Grenoble. I don't think I need to introduce this to you, but just to give you an idea about how much use we get. So both bi biologists, um, academic and industrial come to Embel Grenoble and use our services there. Um, so we have 2,500 annual visits uh, in, the, in the space of 2016 to 2018. Um, and we have lots of lab users who come and use our high throughput crystallization approaches, as well as our screening approaches. And we have um, a very uh, good network of collaborations, both nationally and internationally, uh, thanks to this, uh, this wonderful site. And of course, the power of this campus, uh, I don't need to explain to you. It, it has provided, I think, some of the, the major breakthroughs that we have seen in structural biology and science, and, and I'm sure much more to come. Embel Grenoble also translates and innovates around the world. Many of the instruments I mentioned to you are, that are used now around the world came from, uh, from Embel and Embel Grenoble in particular. And I think this is something that, uh, that, that um, the, the people on the EPN campus should be proud of because it's thanks to, to this collaboration also that this was able to happen. So now the science of women. Um, I've talked to you a lot about, you know, EMBL and the science that we do. And um, so what is the science of women? Uh, and I just want to show you this photo, which I'm sure many of you have seen before. I mean, up until, you know, a century or so ago, um, this was a typical photo of a sort of meeting of scientists and, you know, spot the outlier. Well, the outlier happened to be Marie Curie in this photo. And I think it was in this context that Albert Einstein, who's sitting there um, in the middle, said that she was probably one of the most intelligent people he had ever met in his life. But she was on her own, as you can see in this photo. And indeed, the trajectory of women in science um, has not been um, necessarily as, uh, I would say, rich and, and, and populated as it should have been. I'm showing you some of uh, you know, my favorite highlights here of the women in science. Um, Marie Curie is a great inspiration. Her daughter, Irene Jolio Curie, um, I worked at the Curie Institute and it's clear that um, you know, being a scientific uh, woman uh, comes with a lot of challenges when you see and you read about some of the things that Marie Curie had to contend with. And yet there was a freedom of spirit that, uh, that never left. And I think this can be said for all the women that I show you here. And I want to highlight the, re the most recent uh, Nobel Prize, Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier. It turns out that Emmanuel Charpentier was actually one of the first group leaders that our EMBL Nordic partnership hired in Umea many years ago. And she actually has been 
uh, has often said that it was thanks to the freedom that the EMBL model provided her that she was able to conduct this basic research that in the beginning, no one was very interested in, you know, understanding how bacteria uh, fight uh, their challenges was not something that most um, uh, the, 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 the community were interested in, but this was something that she was able to pursue. And of course, this led to the most amazing revolution in biology, which is CRISPR-Cas9. And I want to show here also one of our latest uh, great successes, Joanna Vancic, who's actually from Emble Grenoble. She did her PhD with Stephen Cusack, and she was awarded the Laurel UNESCO Prize for Women in Science uh, last year for the work that she did to actually crack the cycle of uh, influenza virus uh, trans transcription. Um, and so this just shows that indeed there's an increasing uh, uh, recognition of women in science, but yet there is still a long way to go. And I just want to um, put this quote up that I'm sure some of you have heard. Um, right now, it will apparently take 258 years for the gender gap to close, at least in physics. We hope in biology this is happening faster, but the change is happening far too slowly. And it's a fact, science is sexist. I don't think we should hide ourselves from it. This is something that we see all around us, and I'm sure all of us would have a, a story to tell. And I just want to now give you what this challenge for science actually means. So this is showing you, at least in the biology, biological uh, career trajectory, um, at the PhD level, it's almost 50-50 um, women and men. Actually, there are more women that tend to go into biology to do a PhD than there are men. But it's a leaky pipeline. And in the beginning, the pipeline is pretty robust. Um, you know, women who do their PhDs are supported and, uh, and, and move on to their next steps. But this is where things start to change. Even at the postdoc level, you start to see that there are more men than women that carry on even to that level. The, the pipeline is really starting to leak quite badly. And by the time you get to the leadership level and the level of uh, group leader or head of department or head of institute, this is where things get very, very bad. And indeed, in the life sciences, I think we can say it's approximately only 20% of women. It's getting better. And I have to say, it's one of the reasons I took the job that I've taken is because I felt that I had a duty as a woman, um, in fact, to take on a leadership role, because it does actually provide an example. I wouldn't say it provides a model, but it provides an example that hopefully can help other women take those decisions uh, when they're offered to them. So EMBL's mission, and this already began before I became DG, but you can imagine as Director General that I really do want to um, support this very strongly. EMBL um, is, as I said to you, you know, a, a life sciences organization. We're a powerhouse for cutting edge research in Europe. We attract young talent, and we nurture them, we give them the freedom to explore the questions that they're interested in, and then we give them back to the European or global landscape. So we can help, EMBL can help in attracting women, in helping them in their careers, and, in, and then providing um, new models of how to do uh, female science uh, across the, the world. So this is what we want to do. We want to train the next generation of European scientists. We want to provide our services in the life sciences to our member states, and it has to have an equally male and female face. And we want to support industry through technology development. And this is an area where indeed women are rarely actually seen in leadership positions. And this is, I think, something that we would like to change. So basically, yes, to, to do breakthrough science, you need women. We are half of the population. And um, many of the best minds are being lost through this leaky pipeline that I showed you earlier. And um, EMBL and I believe that it's a diversity, um, not just making sure that gender balance is, is appropriate, but also diversity at all levels in backgrounds, in culture and experience that actually will help us uh, become a better society and a more innovative and, and productive community when it comes to the life sciences. So EMBLS has set up an Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Committee. Um, this was set up, as I said, before my time. Um, but we have many, many different areas that we would like to explore. In training, um, obviously, there is subconscious bias. And this is something that we are realizing um, has to be dealt with right at the roots. And so we have a committee who are actively 
uh, working on a strategy to make sure that in our next program, from the outset, we, we ensure that training uh, tries to overcome this subconscious bias. And I'd be happy to discuss it later for those of you who are interested. We think that um, hiring is obviously important. And I guess, you know, my example of being the director general should be um, the beginning of an example. At, at Emble, I should say, you know, we only have um, about 10 or 20% of women at top leadership positions. Um, as you go down into the uh, other layers of the organization, things get better. Overall, we're about 50-50. Um, Emble is 50-50 overall, but indeed there definitely seems to be a glass ceiling and we have to stop this, but we're getting better. And just in the last couple of years, we've gone from 20% to 40% in our group leader and team leader hires in women. We don't know whether that's just a lucky accident. Maybe it's something to do with also uh, a slightly more female uh, face to Emble, or maybe this is truly because some of the um, moves that we put into place are working and we're attracting more women and retaining them and allowing them to come um, into leadership positions and group leader positions. We're changing our policies. This is something that we've started and that we're actively working on in the coming years. We need to make sure that our policies are modern and uh, forward looking when it comes to uh, not just gender, but diversity um, as a whole. And we need to raise awareness. I, I really, um, had not realized as a young scientist just how important it is to talk about these things and to speak out and to make sure that at all levels and in everything that we do, um, there's an awareness that um, you know, gender and diversity matter. And so how have we started to put this into place? There are many actions that Anvil um, has, has undertaken. Um, as I said, it's not just about gender, it's also um, diversity of all levels. So LGBTQ+, where we're very um, uh, active proponents. Uh, we also have organized uh, workshops, meetings on various topics. I want to say that we're becoming more vocal. We make public statements about um, female scientists and their careers. There was a recent paper that had to be retracted that made some extraordinary comments about uh, female mentors and the impact that they have on, on careers. And, and this paper, Eileen Furlong, who is the um, um, the head of our Equality Diversity Committee, actually made a statement uh, to, in support of retraction of this paper. Um, and we also have set up various programs. And this is one thing I just wanted to quickly mention. Um, we've set up uh, a, a LEAP program, which is um, a leadership and excellence for aspiring pro postdocs. And it's a mentorship program that's tailored for female postdocs who want to pursue a career in science. And thanks to donations from Emble Network, Emble's network of supporters, we were able to set this up so that group lead, so postdocs who want to become group leaders or PIs can actually be mentored by other female scientists. Um, and this is something that we feel is very important to empower science, um, sci female scientists to go to leadership positions. We're also setting up a program that's called Helping Hands, which is to support um, a support infrastructure to allow uh, female scientists who go on maternity leave to continue to be productive. Um, it's always a challenge when uh, a, a woman is expecting her baby uh, during her maternity leave and even after. And we've tried to think of ways that we can help at least during maternity leave by um, helping to support uh, for technical help so that experiments can continue, for example. So these are just a few of the things that we're trying to set up. Um, and there are many, many actions that I think we should take. And I'll come to them at the end of my presentation in a minute. After um, we, we held a, a big conference on gender uh, and diversity in academia, and that has been extremely important in opening people's eyes in what should be done next. I want to just say a couple of words about what it is to be a woman in science. And I think um, Rosalind Franklin, who I think is perhaps the most appropriate of women scientists to mention in this group today, Obviously, chemist and X-ray crystallographer. She was um, one of the ones who cracked the the double helix of uh, helix of DNA, and her 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 work was not recognized appropriately, as I'm sure many of you know. And now I hope it is. But in any case, she was quoted as saying, "Science and everyday life cannot and should not be separated." So, what does this actually mean in practice? Well, if you go back to Lavoisier, Madame Lavoisier was um, extremely helpful to her husband. Um, she was a, a, a scientist herself. And the, the, the home place of the Lavoisiers was actually very much occupied by the science that both Lavoisier himself and his wife were doing together. So of course, this was uh, 
things have changed. Now uh, women don't have to be married to a man in order to become scientists, but still it's a challenge. And actually this is one of my favorite cartoons. I show it often and I apologize for those you've seen already seen it, but um, how do you actually manage to balance your, your life if you have a family and your career and you know, um, laying an egg is not an option. So basically, um, this is something that's really been hit home very much in the current context of the pandemic. And the COVID-19 crisis has really been, I think, a challenge for women. And we held um, an extraordinary virtual conference on this topic at EMBL. Um, I just hear a couple of quotations from the United Nations Secretary General. COVID-19 could reverse the limited progress that has been made on gender equality and women's rights. Um, so this was said in 2020, and it looked like, looks like his warning has now become a prediction. Why? Well, because in times of economic crisis, the first thing to go are the women. And I can see this, I have seen it in the past, um, in countries where the economy uh, becomes difficult, where science is not as supportive as it could be, it's often the women who decide to opt out of the scientific career. And down here in gray, the COVID crisis seems to be the perfect excuse to choose the career of one member of the family only. And this sadly has often resulted being the career of the man. This is actually something that a postdoc of mine said to me recently. She herself has a very supportive husband and they share the home schooling or home um, care of their child. But all around her, she says, even her generation, you know, a young woman in her twenties, she's seeing this and we are seeing this, that indeed in this time of crisis pandemic, um, one has to actually look after not just children, but family, parents, grandparents, and it's very often the woman who decides to make that sacrifice or who decides to take that role. And this is something that we really do have to be aware of. So, um, as I said, we had a meeting earlier um, or late, uh, late last year in October 2020. This was a joint meeting between EMBL, EMBO, our sister organization, and HHMI. It was an amazing meeting, which um, you can watch. All the talks are on YouTube, um, and you're welcome to watch them. And we covered many, many different topics, thinking about gender roles and their impact in academia. I will not go through um, everything, but I just wanted to end with giving you some of the take home messages from this. It's clear there's no silver bullet to dealing with gender balance and roles in academia. First of all, in different areas, be it um, physics, chemistry, biology, or other areas of academia, it's clear that the career trajectories are different and making sure that there's a gender balance um, is something that one has to uh, tailor to all, each of those different trajectories. One thing though that is in common is that young women should be encouraged to, to go into scientific careers, even at the uh, schooling age, which brings me back to what I said right at the very beginning. Nurturing young girls to take on scientific careers, I think is something that we still um, have to work on. We need to make sure we have proper processes and structures. This is something that it's often a, a, a box ticking exercise that was done that has to change. It has to be true. Um, processes involved in hiring, evaluation, promotion, career development. We have to revisit meritocracy. What is it that constitutes um, an excellent scientific candidate? And if we revisited that meritocracy, uh, I think there would be a lot more women that would actually be able to come into um, uh, scientific careers. Reverse mentoring is a very powerful tool. I don't have time to go into it, but um, getting the people um, in our, our constituents as it is to actually tell us uh, what we should change is very helpful. Those of you who have children will sh I'm sure know what I'm saying. You know, listening to what the younger generation has to say about us is important and equally listening to each other about gender and diversity is very important. And we need to recognize the work-life balance. I already alluded to this. This is something that is very, very acute in this pandemic. And we need to embrace our differences. Of course, men and women are not the same and react differently. And that is our power. Um, and that is what we should be working with. And we need to leverage this di diversity and make sure that it's actually something that we, that we actually promote as opposed to try to, to hide uh, or, or, or even uh, avoid. And we all need to put our gender glasses on. We have to be vigilant and proactive. This is something, I, this is an expression I love to use. Whenever you go into a meeting, whenever you sit down and look at a pile of applications, whenever you go and have a discussion, imagine you put your gender glasses on and just think, is this really a, a balanced uh, community, balanced discussion, et cetera? It often is these days, but sometimes it isn't. 
So nurturing women in science, um, this is something that EMBO has often worked on uh, and, and white papers have come out and there was a wonderful um, document that came out about exploring quotas in academia. There are pros and cons. I'm very happy to discuss this later, um, but indeed one needs to have a strategy in order to make sure that in a few years time, I would hope we don't even have to have a talk like mine about women in science by a woman. So I want to end with this slide, which is to say that we should all encourage women to become scientists, encourage women to take on leadership roles and put our gender glasses on and promote parity at all levels of science. It's a wonderful job to have being a scientist and there should be as many women as men in it. And I do hope that some of what I've said will provide some food for thought. Thank you.